Welcome to this special conversation where we are taking a deep dive into the energy sector reforms, far-reaching far reforms which were triggered by President Uhuru Kenyatta, whose intention is to scale down power tariffs in, in this country by as much as 33% based on his announcement on Marshu Jade in 2021. And we are privileged to have the Cabinet Secretary in charge of this ministry, Madam Ambassador Dr. Monica Juma. Welcome on set. Thank you, Julian. Let's kick this off with the the fact that if you read the Power Purchase Agreements Task Force report, the intimation is that there's a desire to harmonize the IPP tariffs, the independent power producer tariffs, with the Kenjan tariff. When you speak to industry players, they raise concern that there is an element of the financing used. So Kenjan benefits a lot from concessional financing. IPPs reuse uh, commercial financing. So the concern is how then do we play on the same field? Is, real, is it really an apples for apples comparison here? Well, first of all, Julian, very pleased to be on set with you. And uh, this is the first uh, time I'm actually speaking to this question of energy since I took up uh, my job as the Cabinet Secretary for Energy. And it's true. I think the fundamental issue around here is the ongoing reforms uh, in the energy sector. But it, other than answer the first question around comparison of Kenjen and IPPs, I think it is important to place this in context, that these reforms are about the entire value chain. It's about uh, in order that we can deliver a, the constitutional mandate, which is to provide Kenyans with clean, sustainable, reliable, low-cost energy. That is the essence of this. And you cannot look this just at, at one section of that value chain. Yes, uh, uh, generation is important, but you'd have to look at the entire value chain from generation to transmission through to distribution. Having said that, it is true that Kenjen is one of our key players in the generation side of things. And it is also true that at this point they are generating at the lowest cost. But and, and there's a whole set of factors that are explaining that. It's not just the finances, far from it. It also has to do with the, uh, the, 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 the management and, and all sorts of the, the, the competency in terms of the technology. There's a lot of things. So to just say, you know, uh, are we the same and are we, and, and frankly, we are looking at a whole set of things. It doesn't mean even within the IPPs themselves, there is consistency. You know, so to just sit down and say, you know, we are one group versus a Kenjian thing is not exactly factual and it's not the truth. So we are deep diving on each of these IPPs and each one of them has all sorts of different issues, including Kenjian, which is an IPP as well. So we're going to be having this conversation across uh, that section of, of, of generation of uh, energy and ideally is to make sure that we get value for the investment. Okay. CS, recurrently you have mentioned that um, you've extended the invitation to IPPs come to the negotiating table out of your own volition. Let us see what we can work out around this renegotiation of tariffs. So far, what proportion would you say have come to the table out of their own desire? And for those who are not, what sticky issues are they raising? Actually, you'll be surprised. We have uh, sat down with 77 IPPs. So it's, it's, a, it's a good number, very, very good number, actually. And the biggest ones are all in, you know. Um, there has been a demonstration of very uh, strong goodwill. There is a, a shared commitment of the need for the reform. And in fact, many of them have offered proposals. So we are walking this path together. And, and I think the desire for this reform is not just a government of Kenya desire. We have heard it from the public. There has been calls for it from industry. And there has been calls for it from big players, even investors, you know. So it's really, it's not a government versus IPPs. So yes, we did call out. And yes, we had uh, two uh, sessions that were led by the uh, chief administrative secretary. Very invaluable very, very invaluable insights, and they are really helping us in terms of setting the parameters of a engagement with the individual IPP. So I'm very pleased at that. And I believe strongly that uh, as we move into the next stage, it is possible uh, to work through a process that is mutually beneficial for both parties. 
I see. One of the proposals in the task force report is exploring the use of the Kenya shilling as the PPA currency. And why that's a matter of intense interest is because if I'm an IPP and I'm sourcing financing, which is foreign currency denominated, and my sales are in shillings, there tends to be an, a foreign exchange misalignment or challenge here because if the shilling is losing, then your cost of servicing the debt becomes higher. Do you see that as a very plausible uh, end game in one of the agenda items of the task force reforms? Well, that cuts both ways, you know, that cuts both ways. If we denominate this in, uh, in, in, in forex, it's the same if, if uh, we should have the, the shilling weakening. But I think we are also being informed by history. If you look at the history of our shilling, it has not been volatile. Secondly, we are having a growing number of investors that are local, you know, and we are focusing also on this category of IPPs that we would wish to encourage because some of these are small scale. It is our young people that are interested to get into the energy sector and there is no rationale for them to denominate in Forex. You know, so again, this is something that we are going to be looking on a case, on a case by case basis. And um, uh, we are sure that we will find a way uh, forward. Fundamentally, the Kenyan shilling has not been volatile. And, and we believe that it is possible to work a mechanism of financing that is also, that, that uh, uh, spreads the risk, so to speak, because that's what you're talking about, that spreads the, the risk in an equitable manner for both ourselves as government, but also for the investor. I see. So yes, let me just uh, push on on that point a little bit. Um, how soon would you like to see this? come into play. I know the energy sector reforms are a rolling basis. We are pretty much at the start, if I could say. But in your desire as the person steering this, how soon do you like this to come into force? Well, I think there are a number of things that have already happened, you know, as you know. Um, but in the, in the, there is an immediate immediate actions that have taken place. We are looking into the medium term. Some are going to go a little bit longer. But uh, just to, to, to signpost to this, this reform is not beginning now, you know. It, it begins from its framing in the Constitution, 2010, as I'm sure you heard from the other interview that, uh, that, that, uh, that, that you, you held. It, we, we are also coming into the Energy Act, 2019, uh, we are having the presidential task re report, and, and what is important now is that that task report provides us with a handle to accelerate some of that reform, which then talks to the questions around the tariff. But we are also having institutional reforms around the, the alignment of mandates. You know, you know, there has been a lot of work around how do we make sure that our entities that are dealing with generation focus on generation, that we have uh, 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 an IOS, uh, an, uh, an ISO, you know, independent uh, systems operator, which is now the Ketraco, that we focus on rural electrification. You know, that alignment of, of mandate is ongoing now. So a lot of things are happening. Some are going to be short term. Some are going to be medium term. Some are going to be, might take a little longer, for instance. We are talking about the, the power market, and we are in the process of, of creating the regulations and things like that. That will not be this month, but there is no doubt that in the medium term we are going to go that way. It links, of course, with the development of the power pools, you know, and therefore the generation lines along that, which takes a little bit longer than a, a year maybe, but we are, we are moving in that direction. So depending on what reform you're talking to, I think they, what my task is, and how I define my task, is to create the momentum along that pathway. You know, and, and of course, this goes to the bigger global agenda of decarbonization, you know, and where we are talking about, you know, how do we maximize our renewables uh, within the national aspiration. We believe that by 2030 we should be fully green. Uh, but there's also a conversation about uh, green hydrogen, you know. And so this is a, a story that is going to be evolving, and it is quite exciting, frankly, given the vanguard role that Kenya is playing. So yes, I'd like to speak a little bit about um, Kenya Power. One of the, the world over, tariffs should be cost reflective. 
And the question that begs now is that if you scale down the tariffs from what they were by 33%, will it be cost reflective? Will the utility be able to recover its operational costs, recover its capital costs in terms of debt financing? Does that come across to you as a potential challenge, even as you roll out these reforms? Well, you know, there is no reform that is easy, and especially on an entity that has been somewhat uh, trying to turn around, okay? But the signals are there for anybody to pick. Uh, the, first, the last financials of KPLC are on an upward trend. Uh, the last three months since I arrived at, uh, uh, at Energy have been indicative in terms of just uh, improving efficiency and what that can do. Uh, our own technical losses are really unacceptable. You know, and so just focusing on those things, and, and we have experience across government, whether you're talking about KPA, whether you're talking about KMC, small as it is, or whether you're talking about the transition from telecoms to Safaricom. I mean, we have examples. So what you do, you, you do not hurt a company by making things right. You actually improve it, and that is what we intend to do and what we are doing with KPLC. Is... Uh debt restructuring on the table because um, in the last cycle we do understand there was a bit of it undertaken and in light of COVID understandably so but going forward do you see it as still in the menu of options? We are going to have all manner, all options will be on the table are on the table it, it is not a future thing you know and uh, but most fundamentally we are working on a number of pathways you know and I think some of the pathways can actually deliver a huge fact of transformation you know and, and those are some of the ones that i'm paying close attention to uh, actions that are going to give me quick returns you know because as as you as, as you rightly observe if you're going to do a tariff reduction of 33 you really have to match it with productivity at a higher level than that and that's what we are paying attention to okay uh, industry players will argue that um the immediate focus should have been on scaling down significantly the technical losses. And maybe what is needed is more clarity in terms of what is actually being done. Because for many, they will argue, that's actually the elephant in the room. Well, I don't think it's one thing. I think we are, we are, this is a big ship, and we are, going, we are turning it at the same time. Some parts of it will move faster, and there is no doubt that the first 15% average of tariff reduction has uh, benefited a lot from taking away some of that uh, technical losses, system losses within KPLC. But I believe we can do more. I believe that the alignment across the entities in energy is important. I believe that clarity in terms of the decision-making process and standards bearing is key because part of their arguments you hear from IPPs is that because we are not sure about how this process rolls, then we load, we do a front loading kind of stuff, you know. And, and so just the comfort and, and the, the predictability of decision making and a business process that gives comfort along that, 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 along that line, I believe, will provide confidence for the investors themselves to be able to, to be with us for much longer without panic. You know, sometimes you almost feel like there's a kind of a panic. But I think there is a sense that uh, everybody believes uh, the path we are taking in terms of instituting business processes that are uh, transparent, that are understood, you know, and you, you, you reduce the room of discretion. Because I think there has been a lot of discretion in, in this sector. And so there are a number of things that need to be done. Uh, it's not just one. I, I don't think this is about just one thing, which is systems losses. I think it's much more, including the change of the culture and the doctrine in the organizations. You know, one of the big things that uh, we know we are working on is just customer service, you know. And you know, probably yourself and many Kenyans have, uh, um, uh, have been confronted by unpleasant experiences as far as customer service is concerned. Now, that is important, just as important because we are a service provider. So it's not one, I think, Julian. It's a, a number of things that must be done in concert so that you can provide fast comfort, but you can also provide confidence that you're doing the best you can. And one of the good examples of this is just the response that we had 
after the, the, the incidences of the collapse of the pylons. You know, that reaction, reacting in the right time, uh, co uh, communicating to Kenyans on, on what was going on, because the scale of it was, was actually quite frightening, you know, but communicating in the right time and doing what you must do in order to restore service, that's what needs to happen. So it's a lot of things that need to happen at the same time in order that you can create reliability and you can create also resilience in the system to, to, to pro, pro provide for power in a systematic, uh, in a reliable manner. Okay. So yes, if you read Kenya Power rep annual reports going back many years, and uh, I've covered Kenya Power for quite a while, one of the issues really raised as a challenge by management is unrealized revenue. And realized in the sense that we sold power, but it's not being paid for. And one of the culprits is government. MDA is just not paying their power bills. Well, right now they are. But again, I think it, it has to do with the capacity to collect also. You know, yeah, MDAs might not be paying, but also what is the system we have in place for collection? You know, and so again, it, it's a question about what, what are the business processes for this? You know, because there is no reason why government should not be the first pay. Uh, a pair of, of, of uh, consumed power. Yeah, but the point you make is, a, is an important one. I have seen it. I, we've had to follow through in order to make sure we get our money uh, to, for the 15% tariff reduction, and we will continue to do so. I think fundamentally it is a system of collection yeah. Yeah, of your debt because you have to do it if you provide a service. That's what banks do. We should do that. Uh, could you give us a sense in terms of um, how large it is by way of a quantum and how you're intending to scale it down from the government side? Well, I think it's a lot of things. We, we must, make, uh, we must uh, create contact with the, with, the, uh, with the consumers. You know, there has been a situation where there is not even correspondence and even whether you're talking about the national government and uh, you'd be surprised at some of the culprits, you know, and, and, and the accounting officers just don't pay attention to it. I think it's a matter of just making sure you follow through and collect your debts. Because it is there, it has been consumed, and there is provision for its payment. Okay. So yes, going back to the task force report, one of the biggest surprises for Kenyans was that uh, the recommendation that uh, we retain the take or pay model. Because uh, again, if you read Kenya Power Annual Reports, recurrently they've said we need to review this model. Um, are we stuck with take or pay? No, we're not. But uh, at, the, at, the, at the moment, we only have one utility that uptakes power, you know, and, and this is the logic in terms of, uh, this was the logic in terms of securing the investment, because if you're going to generate power, you need to sell it. I think that's going to change as we develop the power market, you know, as we do the interconnection clearly, um, and, and we don't have to, th there is no, the, 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 the acquisition of the power, the uptake, then does not depend on one, on, on one uptaker, in this case KPLC. So I think we are moving in that direction, but as we sit now and before we go to this point, there was only K KPLC that could uptake power from anyone. So really it's a guarantee for the investment, more, and that was the logic that drove that. But there's no doubt that as we move into a different model, into more markets, into more consumers. You know, we do an interconnection with, with Uganda depending on the need on the other side or our side. We do a connection with Tanzania, with uh, 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 Ethiopia. Then the logic breaks down and you do not need to do a take or pay. See, as if I'm hearing you right, you are intimating something around the liberalization of the market. And if you read the Energy Act of 2019, and the, particularly the provision around open access, and the potential uh, opportunity for generators to go directly to consumers, many of us have been wondering how soon will we get this activated? Well, you know, it is happening already, even though it is on small scale. You know, we are beginning to experiment with it. You know, we have many, we are, we are big consumers that are doing direct, you know, uh, generating and supplying directly to themselves or some of them into the grid like ATDA is doing and things like that. So it is being experimented and uh, in fact when we do the off-grid 
which are multiplying and we are beginning to look at it as a way also of stabilizing power access across the country. You have more and more of this. So I, I see it developing. It's another development area that is likely to explode because you cannot just depend on uh, the, 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 the network that we are having right now onto the national grid. So increasingly, I think it's going to be the model, and it is being pushed by demand, really, and, and the idea that it is also easier for the system when you have different points of, of generation of power and distribution of power. It is better than just depending on one national grid. I see. Speaking about demand, CS, um, if, if we disaggregate the tariff and we have the capacity charge and the energy charge, and the bigger challenge here being the capacity charge because you need a lot of demand for the cost per unit to go down. One of the concerns raised by industry stakeholders is that um, the demand being onboarded in this country is weak. So we have a lot of people being put onto the system, uh, but they're not uh, able to pay for the power. So do you feel that we have a demand side challenge again when you look at the energy space? Well, I don't think so. It depends on where you're looking. You know, it depends on where you're looking. And, and I think it, this has to be conceived in terms of what is the value of power. At one level, power is a social service. Eh? You know, and I think there's a big debate about, you know, they are not paying, it is not cheap, is it cheap, is it expensive? I mean, it depends on where you're standing in this, you know, in this quantum. So at one level, power is a social service, you know, and that is the logic of the last mile. You know, but we have seen coefficiency between power and development. Okay, there is no doubt, there is no doubt that uh, even in a rural place where power is provided as a social service, it has a multiplier effect. It becomes a force multiplier, so to speak, whether it is in terms of education, that kids can sit under a bulb and have an hour, extra hour to revise. You suddenly see the performance in schools changing. That you have power in the local dispensary, then you can put, you can, you can store the vaccine. And in, incidentally, the health status of this community goes up. You know, in a little market space, that might, you know, and this is why the government had the the the, the 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 presence of mind to say it is not about the payment it is about the service because the impact of that in terms of value addition is greater than just lighting a bulb and whether you're going to pay for that bulb or not because i've been i've had a lot of discussions after i've gotten into energy about how it is not about uh, the energy being expensive it's about it being reliable that's what we need to do no we need both we need it to be a, a reliable and we need it to be cheap so that we can drive the economic activity and productivity around it. So really it depends on where you are sitting in, in terms of this argument uh, about demand <laughs> okay. and, and charges. So, so maybe to stick on to that question, do you see much wiggle room for this country to scale down the capacity charge? Because it's, it's a very big challenge. Yeah. Because as long as the demand is not growing as fast as the supply is, uh, if I'm an IPP and I undertook to supply this power, the fact that it's in the uh, I've given capacity, I will charge Kenya power. Yeah, Th that is true. I mean, I think we are having, but that balance, that balance can only be narrowed by productivity. And I don't think it should be narrowed by taking away the service, even from those who cannot pay. I, 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 again, we, we come back to the question around equity, you know, and, and, and justice, frankly. Uh, the fact that... Uh, you are unable to pay for a service, does it mean you should never access it? And it's a big debate that is kind of running around in the universal healthcare. You know, it is, it's the same kind of debate. Uh, for me, I, I, I think the demand for power in our country is going to grow, Julian. This nation has been placed by history to, to drive not just itself, but the region. Yeah, and that reality, that responsibility can only be powered by power, you know? And, and, and I think it is very important for people to understand this because it is, when we begin talking, it's not just power for the household. It is power for the value that it adds, you know? And, and today, I mean, everybody going to your rural area, you don't have to go to the nearest big city for a haircut. You know, you, you just walk next to your door and you get a haircut. Now, that doesn't cost, you know, perhaps what you would want to pay in, in 
in the economic sense of the energy, but the multiply effect which makes it possible for you to work from your village, even if there is or there is not COVID, because you can be connected, it, that contributes far more in terms of driving the economy of this country and elsewhere. And, and I think this is what explains our economic performance, frankly, you know. So the, the, it is not a discrete thing. You mu it must be seen in terms as a centerpiece, if you are doing a puzzle, as a centerpiece it, that, uh, that, that completes the entire puzzle, which is the development aspiration of this nation and its leadership in terms of the economics of the region and beyond. Okay. On January the 14th, the Energy and Petroleum Regulatory Authority gazetted Ketraco and designated it as the systems operator. And we understand the rationale behind this, but the question looming outside here is, is Ketraco itself really independent in terms of exercising this mandate? Yes, of course. It, 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 uh, I don't know what independence means in this case. Well, you know, in the case of Kenya Power, Kenya Power was a seller and at the same time is a systems operator. So there was a bit of conflict of interest in terms of dispatch of power. Ketraco, we understand, might not be selling power, but Ketraco is 100% state-owned, and government also has a stake in Kenya Power. So there's a question around the independence here. Well, I think every entity here, to just answer this from a broad perspective, every entity here is governed by a whole set of regulations, laws and regulations and frameworks and things like that. And the idea of designating Ketraco, actually, as the, the, the systems operator, was driven by an analysis that was trying to disaggregate the interests, huh? disaggregate the interest, but also to align, again, the value from end to end, huh? the, the value, so that when you, 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 you carry the power all the way to the point of distribution, you know, and, 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 uh, and what the, the, the process that is ongoing now is the development of the regulations around that, precisely to answer that question about how is it going to be operating. And it's a whole set of issues, actually. It's not just that. It's a whole set of issues even around capacity. You know, how do we then deploy this capacity to make sure that the entire system, you know, the entire system can operate independently of, I don't know why you're saying government, they are still doing the, you, you know, the system, the government is still there now. I don't know why when there are systems operator, then government becomes larger than it is now. So I, I don't think it's a matter that has, has concerned us, but there's a lot of discussions about the modalities of doing this precisely to make sure that uh, it improves the efficacy of the entire system and of the dispatch. You will probably know uh, the, 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 the task force uh, had lots of submissions and a lot of issues, even in the public, around this dispatch. You know? So it is a matter that has been occupying us a great deal, precisely to, to answer to some of those concerns. Okay. See, as you spoke very optimistically around uh, regional power pools, and we, understand, we know they've been in place for a long time, but not really taking off, and really largely because of infrastructural hurdles. Uh, what are we doing from the Kenyan side to ensure that then we begin to leverage on some of these opportunities like the East African Power Pool? If there's a surplus in Uganda, why not get it? If we have surplus, why can't we? We, do, we are doing that actually with Uganda and uh, the discussions with Ethiopia at an advanced stage. In fact, uh, my counterpart will be in the country the next two days precisely for that conversation. So there's a lot of work that is going on. It's just that it's not in the public and we are aware and uh, very keen to really drive this to its logical conclusion so that because it is only until we have the transmission lines and all the infrastructure in place that we can then move to the next step of actualizing this but the Ugandan one is working it's up and functioning and it is very very important in terms of stabilizing the western part of our country okay uh, regarding commercial losses. Uh, one of the conversations that Kenya Power has been having and actually rolling out is the issue of smart metering. Are you able to give us a sense of how far we are with this and how, uh, to what extent do you feel this is sealing the revenue leakage? Well, I have been to, uh, to the workshops that are dealing with uh, smart metering. Um, I am satisfied that we, uh, it, 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 would be, it would be helpful, it is helpful in terms of the leakages. I believe that it can be scaled up, you know, and so we are working towards uh,
pushing as far as, as, as quickly as possible to a universal coverage, particularly for the commercial, uh, the large entities, the users and so forth. So yes, the answer is yes. I think smart metering is helpful. Um, uh, I think it can be uh, increased in terms of the quantum of it. Um, of course, you always run beh uh, behind uh, people trying to, <laughs> to innovate around these technologies, but we are doing everything possible to, to reduce the incidences of bypasses and things like that. They are actually diminishing. We are having a diminished uh, um, uh, abuse of the system, and we believe that smart metering is the way to go. Okay. We do anticipate, uh, if I got it right, the um, second tranche of the 15% reduction coming by the end of this quarter. Um, are we still on course for that? Do you think it's feasible? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. You know, the week before we, we gazetted the tariffs, I was looking at a lot of your media engagement, and there was almost hysterical you know, denial about the, the possibility of the 15%. And when we did it on the 7th, there was almost dead silence. Somewhat people didn't believe it. Uh, well, I can confirm we are on course <laughs> and we are determined, very determined to deliver on the next 15%. But a note to no uh, something to note is that in fact, as we speak now, even the first 15% is an average. In many cases, it was higher than 15%. Yeah. Especially the uh, lifeline tariff. Absolutely, absolutely. And some of it we calculated to 23, 25 percent. So uh, this is happening and it, it is irreversible, as I have said. It is going to happen. So yes, we are on track for it. Kenjin and Kenya Power are some of the entities which were listed by the International Monetary Fund as entity, entities in need of restructuring. And uh, the question that we have is, um, is the option of the government scaling down its stake in these entities on the table? Uh, because uh, that has been tabled as one of the ways through which we can ease the burden it exerts on the exchequer by way of bailouts, particularly for Kenya Power, every so often. Well, you know, um, as I've told you, everything, every option is on the table. Um, it's a matter, as they say, uh, the devil is in the detail. Uh, but our focus, the strategic end game that we have put our eyes on, is transformation to make sure that we deliver on low cost power that is reliable huh? and that is sustainable. And I think this is very important. Again, to repeat that to do so, we think that we would have to look, and not we think, we are looking at the entire value chain. Because you can't just look at an institution. We are looking at everything. We are looking at the policy guidance, which is why the move is actually towards generating uh, a white paper on our energy, the future of Kenyan energy, um, so that we can create the policy parameters that are located within the current trends and dynamics, including the entire global decarbonization and climate change agenda. Uh, because that would, de would define the type of investment, you know, and the type of power we want to have, which by extension, what type of technology then becomes relevant. There are big questions, there are big strategic questions that require to drive the way our investment lands in this country. But there are also other issues around the whole question of institutional reforms. Uh, institutional reforms, not just in one place, and, and this is driven right from the regulator's point of view. You know, what, what is the regulation looking like across the chain, across the chain of, of whether it is in terms of generation and so forth and so forth, all the way to the distribution at, at, at the end point. And then the whole question around the generation itself, the whole point around the transmission itself, because if you have expensive transmission and you, you pass it on, or expensive generation and you pass it on, then it beats the purpose for which you're trying to achieve this. So we are not focusing just on the Kengen as an entity or KPLC as an entity, but the entire ecosystem, because we think that is the only way to provide for our country a resilient, robust, system infrastructure from end to end that will deliver the energy that we are looking for to power our growth as a nation. 
Okay. See, yes, in the fourth quarter of last year, that's 2021, um, there was celebration when Kenya's peak demand uh, shot to 2,036 megawatts. And uh, the flip side of this and what is being raised as a concern is if you consider 2,400 uh, 2,400 megawatts in install capacity. The question is, do we have enough residual, uh, the, the buffer between our peak demand and what is installed? Because uh, industry players will tell you, if you think tariffs are a problem, the problem is actually having undersupply when you actually need it. Does that concern you, CS? Well, it doesn't concern me, but we are looking at it very carefully. I mean, that, that peak demand told us that first of all, growth is, 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 is on an upward trajectory, number one, and I think it is, it is fair to say we should expect this to continue raising. You know, when you look at all the fundamentals and how we are recovering out of the COVID situation, I think it's going to go up. Now, what are we doing about this? There's a number of plants that are already ready, that are being uh, uh, um, uh, uploaded onto the national grid. So we are, we are, nothing has stopped, by the way, because the people are having this conversation as if there is a part of this that has been held constant, nothing. We are, I've, I've told people that we are in the process of mending a plane in flight. Yeah, nothing is stopping. So we are watching this chain, we are watching this value chain constantly you know, to make sure that we do not dip, you know, we do not get to a point where the demand surpasses uh, our installed capacity, so to speak. And, and we are watching that very carefully. A fortnight ago, this country dealt with uh, significant bouts of outage. Um, what scale of impact in your assessment did this have? And two, I know this matter was taken up by the DCI, but what are your findings thus far? Well, that, that was a, a, a bit of a shock to the system, there's no doubt. I think I want to commend the staff uh, in terms of their response. It could have been far more dangerous and worse than it was. And I think it, it, that was mitigated by the speed at which we responded. Um, we were lucky, we identified some of the weaknesses before something tragic happened, like in Naivasha. Um, so, and that kicked in, although we knew we were supposed to look at the system, it kind of hastened that action. So I can say certain things. One, that we have looked at the entire infrastructure across the country to establish its state. Um, two, that we have created a mechanism for constant surveillance on the entire system. You probably have heard of the moratorium on the scrap metal, you probably have had the gazettement of restricted areas so that all energy installations are restricted areas, are in restricted areas to avoid the, the, the possibility of interference with this infrastructure. But we have also uh, begun a very, uh, very important cooperation, which I think should have been there a long time ago, between the energy sector and the, and the Ministry of Interior. In particular, the administration, but also the, the police services. And, and we are working towards the possibility of creating an, a standalone police unit that will look at the energy infrastructure from end to end. So pretty much like what we, we have with the railway police. So th there's a whole range of things that have happened uh, after that experience to, first of all, restore the, the, the network, which is fully restored at this point, to assess the state of the network and to put in place surveillance and maintenance, constant maintenance, so that we do not uh, get surprised, you know, in the future. And that is why a week ago I was able to confidently tell the people everything was on hand. I see. See, as my final question, and really just going back to my first question, because I've had this conversation uh, around power tariffs with a number of the key players in the industry, the regulators as well as the private sector players. And the question of um, the financing is really sticking out as a sore thumb, for the IPPs in particular. And to a degree, you understand where they're coming from. Because um, if I take a loan at the commercial rate, someone is taking a, a loan at a very subsidized rate. Um, why am I expected to scale down my cost to their level? Well, let me tell you one of the facts that I have found uh, uh, rather um, I have discovered, let me put it this way, 
the, the return on investment for most IPPs in our country is ab abnormally high. So there is no IPP that is in Kenya, and I can say this on camera, that is running at anywhere near a loss. Okay? And in fact, comparatively, because we are doing this in a world where this happens, eh? this is happening. So there must be a degree of comparability, you know? So, uh, th and facts don't lie. You know, facts do not lie. So we are, we are going to be uh, directed by facts in this conversation. Um, we are hoping that uh, our investment, some of them who uh, come to Kenya because they believe in the potential of Kenya and uh, uh, to develop, and that is why they are here. Um, and, and none of them is running at a loss. I have not come across any that is running at a loss. Um, so I think this conversation is being over overplayed and, and the juxtaposition with Kenjen is exaggerated to a, to a large extent. So I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, uh, spend too much time on it. We will be dealing with this on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, guided by facts. Um, uh, it, this is not about uh, targeting IPPs. As I've said, I believe strongly. I believe strongly that we could have a conversation that leads us to a mutually beneficial place. Uh, renegotiations of IPPs is not Kenya specific. It has happened in many jurisdictions, developed and developing. So nothing new that we are trying to do. All we want to do is to make sure we can deliver on energy, which is, which is the primary objective of both parties, and that we do it in a sustainable manner, that we do it in a manner that uh, spreads the burden on both ends of this table. Okay, let's close this now. Kenya Power has advertised for a managing director. And the question is, are we done with the purge at Kenya Power? Last year we saw the MD resign, we saw a couple of managers being sent parking. It was quite, quite volatile in that space. Are we done with the purge? Well, I am sure the, in every organization there is movement of staff and you, it's not unique to KPLC and if there is need for any movement, there will be movement. But uh, the objective of any of these uh, uh, staff management issues is to, is to deliver. So we are going to be focusing on delivery and uh, once again, we will do what we have to do to deliver on the mandate we have. Ambassador Monica Juma, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Julia. I truly it's appreciate it. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Sante sana. Sante.